Hey, welcome to another Lorenzo's Music music show. Uh, I talked today with an artist that I played on one of our Creative Commons music shows that we do on Spotify. They actually have tons of different types of music that they put out. The one that I played was more industrial-like, and we talk about that, but they also have kind of an early 80s, late 70s sort of funk sound that they release. They do trance music. Uh, some of their tracks are like 20 minutes long. Some of them are short. Some of them have vocals. Some of them don't. But they have their own home studio, and we talk about the gear. They have an entire room full of gear all hooked up that they're recording in this home studio that they created. And it was just really fun to meet the person, another Creative Commons musician like us, and just talk shop, talk gear, talk about the music that they put out. So here's that interview starting right now. My name is Daniel Glasscock. I am a musician of several decades at this point, I guess. Yeah. Uh, primary projects include everything uh, under the Orbs umbrella. So Oxford Road Basement Studios. We've got Love Undulates, Violently Consciousness Rises Above Fears, my primary project. We've got Hypermortal, a band, more psychedelic metal stuff, Softcore Syndicate, Goofy Funk Music, and uh, Serene Fiend is a, also a band that we've been pretty active in the live scene around here with, which is more of an industrial synth rock type thing. When you say more active, are you saying that you've been playing out or you've been releasing stuff? Um, it's it's just sort of compartmentalized. So most of the live music since COVID that I've done has, actually all of it, I mean, aside from one instance, was with Serene Fiend. And okay. it's more of a, it's definitely something that, live is it's more of a live experience because a lot of the stuff that i do and with other people is more of an introspective styled music it's not this bombastic you know explosive thing and serene fiends definitely like you're at a rock show okay so that that's that's kind of what differentiates it in my mind but it used to be we'd grind a lot on on with the sort of the metal circuit mm -hmm. and and that's sort of how we cut our teeth as musicians. But bar scene, I'm not into it. Right. I'm not into a lot of live venues just by nature of the atmosphere of the whole thing, which is just drunk people yelling at you and spilling things on your pedal board. And you get paid 17 bucks at the end of the night. Uh, that part I don't like, but the other part I don't have a problem with. I, don't, I do hate the getting no. paid 17 bucks part though, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, it's fun when you're just playing out with your friends and stuff, but like, God, I'm exhausted and I got to go to work tomorrow and I'm getting old and, you know, all these, you know, adulty reasons why you just throw in the towel eventually. But I think in little spurts, it's a whole lot of fun yeah. to, to go, you know, hump all that gear up on stage and crank it up as loud as possible and, you know, kick your feet and scream and have a lot of fun. Yeah, it, there's a time and place for it in my mind. I remember when I re so I originally started playing in bands when I was in fourth grade, and I chose oh, wow. yeah I've been doing it for a while, not successfully since fourth grade, but I started <laughs> in fourth grade. You know, we would play for like the neighborhood kids. I think uh -huh. uh, the first couple of songs we knew was Sunday Bloody Sunday and Rock You Like a Hurricane. Oh, nice. You know, that's that's a good. That's a good for mixture, right? You're doing better than the whole lot of high schoolers and college age people I know, that's for sure. <laughs> and well, and I chose to be the singer. I didn't even consider whether or not I could sing. I chose to be singer because all I needed to get was a microphone in my mind. So, mm -hmm. you know, forgetting like PAs and all the other stuff that comes with it, but also because like what you said, I wouldn't have to lug gear. And oh, then yeah. later on in life, it's like, oh, I know, I'll start playing instruments along with singing, so I'm not just standing there, and now I have to look gear. Although I help out anyway. I mean, you gotta. Well, yeah, you, you want to pitch in. It's a communal effort. Yeah. Um, but, man, it, I, so a lot of, like, the last few years before COVID hit, where we were kind of winding down the live thing, was so much me just struggling to find a methodology to justify bringing gear on stage. So it's like, if I could find a smaller amp, if I could find a smaller keyboard, if I could find a lighter bass, 
you know, if I could find a smaller pedal board and, and, you know, it's a zero sum game. I mean, like when you're saying all that, when you're saying that you're talking about like you having that, are you saying the rest of the band? Like, cause I know you have a lot of gear. Oh I've yeah. I mean, like I said, we started doing like metal music, metal people didn't like us, but we were very loud and, and, you know, very big amps, mm-hmm. you know, big stoner doom amps, suns and avatars and soft techs and that sort of thing. And it's hard on your back. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I, I just pare it down and pare it down. And then we got sort of into synthesis, live synthesis mixing with it and and but still too heavy that's still and too much crap between where, a drum set and a bass and a guitar and all these amps and stuff right yeah and where where is this now i just realized i didn't even ask where you're located lawrence kansas kansas okay so you were doing all this in kansas what is the scene like in kansas well broader kansas there's not much of one okay. lawrence has always kind of had a a big thing going on for us i mean you know, back in the 90s, a lot of people would like to conflate the thing and be like, oh, this is like the Seattle of the Midwest. And oh, because Kurt Cobain came and visited William S. Burroughs here. And there's all these and we have hey, the he outhouse. recorded never mind where I am. So I'm in uh, Madison. Oh, in Madison? No <laughs> yeah. way. I didn't know that. Um, so competition yeah, we had, met. <laughs> well, we have we have the outhouse, which oh, okay. is our our big DIY claim to fame. Um, cause you know, everybody played there back in the day okay. and it was chaos and, you know, it was hell's angels running security there and mm. people shooting the AK 47s while the, the band is throwing up, you know, and like they, it's, it's pretty legendary. That's, that's our, you know, big piece of music history, I think, okay. but it's a thriving scene. I, I, you know, since COVID, you know, all live music feels like it's taken a kind of a downturn. Like the bands who really, really want to play, they're going out there and they're doing it. But the casual folks who would just throw a band together for a month or two, you don't see much of that anymore. And especially in the college, there's not a whole lot of performing musicians that are like in a synergized setting. It's a lot of solo acts and a lot of like DJ work. Okay. So, I mean... Kansas City's doing pretty good. Lawrence has always kind of had a steady scene with uh, Replay Lounge and the Bottleneck, two local venues. You get a lot of big acts through there. So, all right, and it's a, I'd say moderate, a moderately good scene. Okay, and I want to talk about the different types of bands that you've been mentioning because this might actually clear up some things for me. So the way that I found out about your music is one I do. uh, We're a creative commons band and I Mm -hmm. have a show where I play creative commons music and I had found your stuff and it was released under creative commons. So I played it. And one of the songs was, I want to say, first of all, it was pronounced gin boogie. Yeah. I just a misspelling, but but there's a J in both words is the way that you did it. Yeah. And that was under the, and I can't even, so we have an abbreviation of your name that, thank God you use, which is Lovecraft. Uh, Uh But otherwise it was under the long name, which is love undulates violently. Consciousness rises above fear. Okay. And I thought it was love undulates violently is greater than, because you use a greater and then symbol in between the the two phrases. I mean, you could, you could put that. Yeah. Because I was like, then it's even longer than what you're telling me. Uh, it's it's just uh it, i thought it looked cool yeah no it does and <laughs> it, it I like, means, well, it and means I, nothing and i uh, love the, the fact that the abbreviation looks like lovecraft kind of like the bad brains or no that's soulcraft never mind okay i was gonna say like this like the bad brains song but i had misremembered the bad no, brain song name. yeah lovecraft is well lovecraft is a mondegreen of hp lovecraft the mm-hmm. the author which and it kind of stemmed from the impulse of cosmic horror Okay. But as as my sound evolved and I was like placing more meaning and context on stuff, uh, uh, Lovecraft, the the long thing, love undulates violently, consciousness rises above fear, is kind of like my mission statement for for how to approach reality in general, and and of course music as an, as my undercurrent. I mean, it's my spiritual core. Yeah. So this is this is like how we should approach the universe in all of its scariness. It's like, 
love, love will reign supreme. Uh -huh. And in conscious thought directs the construction of reality. Okay. Damn. Son. Despite, <laughs> despite the darkness that fear that is always encroaching upon trying to destroy our creative impulses. And is it, uh, it's a, you know, long, very Bob Dignagian, uh, meaning, but I mean, that's, that's just sort of how I justify the, the whole thing. Yeah. And that song that I played now, first of all, when I played the song, it kind of reminded me of like uh, front two, four, two, or like, you know, yeah. late eighties, early nineties, industrial music. And I dug totally, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but the thing was, is then I listened to some of the other songs and they're not all like that. And that's why I was like with these different bands are, you have a bunch of different styles even under the same project. So first of all, tell me about that song and the industrial influence on it. Okay. So, um, that whole album, the Skinwalker. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been doing a lot of albums that are kind of constructed around certain synthetic setups. So Skinwalker was made primarily with analog synthesizers and drum machines. Yeah. It was all the drums on it for the most part are done with a old Korg KR 55 B, which was a, a drum machine that Depeche Mode used a lot. And a few other bands from the eighties, they blended into their drum sound. But uh, I also wanted to make like some gritty acid style stuff stuff. So it mostly used like a Moog Opus three, the KR 55 B, uh, a Moog uh, grandmother, a uh, semi-modular thing, and then like Prophet 5, a Solina, um, sort of standard classic, you know, big keys, mm -hmm. and uh, and then a, a 303. And that, so it's like everything that I can make with those things without using MIDI was the intention of Skinwalker. Uh, oh, you didn't and, program any of that. You were playing it. Okay. It's all, it's all played live. Of course it's edited right. in the studio and stuff and overdubs and overdubs. But um, yeah, it's, it's it, the intention was to make it messy and to make it really dirty and gritty and degraded sounding. And I did a whole bunch of stuff in the mastering process to add to that texture. Cause I'm really into that. Mm -hmm. So Jen Boogie is kind of like a, a Drexia style rave type song for me, Drexia or like early warp records, people, mm -hmm. Aphex twin, um, square pusher, that sort of thing. So nice. that, that, that was the impulse with that one. I've, I've done records before that, that are like, that almost sound more symphonic with a certain type of gear. Like I did an album with just a Roland JX three P mm -hmm. and tried to make all the drum sounds with it, all of the pads and, melodic blips and bloops all just with this one keyboard. And then, so it's, it's like a stylistic challenge for myself with a lot of the, you know, purely electronic music that I do. Okay. What multi, uh, DA, multi track DAW are you using? I'm, I'm pro tools. Okay. All right. And yeah. then with the gear that you have, how long have you been, collecting this gear. I want to know more about this gear that you have. You post pictures of different types of gear all the time. And oh, I'm sure yeah. I'm only seeing like a third of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to brag, you know, whenever I come across <laughs> a new rightfully piece. Rightfully so. Yeah. It's well, cause the, like right at the end of before the pandemic, um, gear prices were still really low, especially on the used market for vintage stuff. Cause even though there was still, the, there was already the fetishization of vintage gear going on. Mm -hmm. There was also really cheap like plugins and alternatives on the market. And people were like getting rid of their old stuff uh, because it was either broken or just trying to part it out or something, just get as much money as they can. Cause they can make that same sound with a computer or with a modern digital equivalent. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, this is my chance. I can, I can buy this stuff up and fix it. You know, just get out a solder gun and look up the components list. And so I, you know, kind of taught myself to restore some of these synthesizers. And okay. then what do you do with them? You, they just sit around and collect dust. No, of course you, you make some music with it. Yeah. So, uh, and that I've, I've kind of been riding that wave for about, eh, you know, a decade at this point, I guess. All right. Cause I got, I, I, when I got the time on my hands, I'm like, 
I want to make weird psychedelic sounds. Mm -hmm. So those, those things are just immediate gateways to that, like psychedelia and funk uh, at, at its core. I think funk is psychedelia at, in a more pure syncopated jazz context. So like having all these keys, all these tools, it's like, wow, you know, wow. <laughs> just lights dancing everywhere. And that's, that's kind of my bag. Okay. And when you're setting up for an album, like what is the, what is the process when you're starting one of these songs, when you get an idea in your head, like you had mentioned, you wanted to do an album like this or like that. Do you research it? Do you just go with it and go, I think I know how it's done. I mean, what's the process for starting a project like that? It's, it's kind, of, kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. Like, I don't know exactly what I want out of this, but it's going to fall into place, you know, like the manifestation thing, you know, you, like I, I have, I sometimes have a really clear idea of what I want. Like mm -hmm. with that JX 3P album, that one, I was like, I want this to sound beautiful. I want this to be like a really beautiful, serene type um, formalist exercise. Uh, but with like other stuff where I'm, I, I like to set formalist rules. Like, it, just like I was talking about with Peter Greenaway, um, so much of his filmography is a, in a formalist setting. He, he mm -hmm. plays games with the medium. He'll play a numbers game. He'll play a lighting game, uh, which will define the process and, and make it a cohesive piece of art simply by nature of directed study. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can create these formalist constructs for your music, Sometimes it inspires things you never expected to do. And it, and I find it's, it's brought a lot of things out of me that I, I couldn't just sit down with a guitar with and do mm -hmm. obviously. And I'm not a keyboard player. You're not, I, I can't, I can barely play keys. I can play chords and stuff and I can, you know, occasionally do a run here and there. Okay. But I'm, with the I'm amount of synths that I've seen you post, I thought you were a keyboard player for sure. Well, I mean, I play keyboards, but okay. I think I think if you were to ask anybody who could, who had rudimentary rudimentary piano playing knowledge, they'd be like, "Oh, that dude's a fraud." Okay. All right. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much guy. in the same boat. Okay, I got you. <laughs> I thought I you were just saying that. you didn't play them at all, and I'm like, "Why do you have?" So okay, oh no, I see what you're no. saying. Yeah. No, no I, all I right. Then that's me them. too. <laughs> I play them, but they're not, uh, it's not my, it's not my, uh, virtuosic expertise. Okay. You know, I'm a bass player. I play bass really well. Mm -hmm. I sing, I, I think I sing pretty good mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm an all right songwriter. So it's like to always, I, you know, David Bowie, he was like, always reach a little further than you think you're able to. Um, and, and he's right. He's right. A hundred percent of the time. Always just reach a little far out of your depth. Always just go a little bit deeper into the pool. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, just whenever you're uncomfortable enough thinking like, I can't do this. That's whenever you're like on the, the verge of the coolest thing you've ever done. And that's, that's how that's happened to me like time and time again, you know, as a, as an ethos. Yeah. Most people would think, uh, Back in the day, they would say, well, he shouldn't have thought that when he did Tin Machine. But I liked Tin Machine, so I was happy when he did that. I, yeah, I actually no. enjoyed that album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little more forgiving with, with really, like, uh, avant-garde mm -hmm. type stuff. And, and now that I'm getting older, I feel like I'm way more forgiving with, like, sort of like adult contemporary stuff because it's like <laughs> you know you know they wanted to just refine it and and like smooth it over a little bit better because that's just part of uh, getting older i feel like is is like you want to take some of the hard edges off of it and like make it a little more texturally rich and maybe a little more extravagant or maybe maybe just dial it in more mm -hmm. uh, i i mean i'm speaking so broadly here though so. right well now you were talking about your songwriting process and then what i want to know is when you are songwriting there are some songs you have or maybe it's just one or two but they're like 20 minutes long oh um, yeah so how do you i mean i understand how you can do that but 
you've released it like that. And one question I have is like, so writing a 20 minute tune, are you actually overdubbing that? Like multi-tracking or is it just something that you do in one setting? It's sort of free form. Like how are you going about those longer songs? It's a mixture of it. Um, like, like for instance, okay, I have like procedural bovine tissue extraction by interdimensional entities. Okay. That one is about 28 minutes long. It was mostly pieced together from some uh, isolated bass synth jams from a different jam hmm. of, of with live musicians, and then a full sit down with a Prophet Rev 2, and I just played for 28 minutes. Okay. And I, and I sculpted the sound with the filters and, and envelopes and stuff. I, you know, I'd hold a couple keys or whatever and just like let it ride out and create this landscape with the music. And then I'd, I'd maybe go back and do another overdub of that interplaying with the original 28 minute part. And if there was a little thing in there and there always is, if there was a little thing in there where like I turn, I, I op or I close the filter too quick okay. or I, I turned up the noise too, too much. I'll just go in and edit it a little bit and smudge it or whatever. And, and that adds to the psychedelia of the thing. Yeah. But then there's other tracks where, man, you know, I'll do eight hours, like in an augmented state, I'll do about eight hours of uh, playing. Mm -hmm. And I take like for that's for like ontological phalluses, 1989. That one was about, I think I, I think I did the majority of the tracking of that over the course of seven straight hours. Come on now. Really? Yeah. I Damn, mean, son. I don't, okay. I don't remember some of it cause it was like sort of a trance like state for me. Yeah. Um, I did it over the course of a night. So I, you know, I pulled an all nighter and it was kind of like ecstatic, you know, probably, probably not the healthiest thing to do, but I, I mean, cause I don't remember some of it, you know what I okay. mean? Okay. But then I edited it down and I chopped it down and chopped it down. And like, I found, Oh, this is the, this is that morsel of the song. And then I just go back through and do another like 20 minute take over it. Uh, and maybe add some textures from drum machines fading in and out and effects pedals and stuff. It's, it's all exploratory and, and there's no pressure on those types of yeah. compositions. Like it's, it's whatever you want to make of it. So there's no payoff to it aside from just the you get to sit in this landscape for a while. It's yep. not like a chorus where you get the oh this is the best part. Oh, <laughs> right. yeah. oh and then the drop, yeah. No, there's <laughs> there's none of that. So you don't have to adhere to a formula. You just I love the fact that somewhere you have with these songs a Zack Snyder cut of, of <laughs> you know what you did. Oh, God. You do not want to hear the Zack Snyder cut of Ontological Fowls is 1989. <laughs> But believe me, the other thing too is, do you, do you ever consider live streaming these? Cause that sounds like something that would be perfect for like a Twitch live stream or a YouTube live stream where you're doing these things. That. Yeah. I've, I've considered that, but also like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's still a part of it that's private to me. And, okay. you know, as much as I want to like get it out and like let people enjoy it, if they, if they're even into it, I've been a pretty bad marketer all my life in terms of okay. like music. So like with that though, it feels like, you know, the, the, the particle beam duality thing where like you observe a, a particle and it changes its behavior in mm -hmm. physics. I, I kind of feel that, you know, sneaking suspicion that music is the same way. Like whenever you have somebody watching you, or whenever you're in a collaborative state with other people mm -hmm. where they're watching you too and listening to you actively, that changes the way you play and it changes what you create. Mm -hmm. So in a completely isolated state where a lot of that stuff comes from, like the really desolate textures and landscapes and all that sort of thing, I feel like you really have to be completely unwatched, you know, like you're the, you're the bear taking the shit in the woods. <laughs>
if you catch my drift. (laughs) It's funny because uh, we have the exact opposite thing, whereas I started live streaming our songwriting sessions because it forces us to dick around last. Uh, you know, oh yeah. It, so what it is is it's like we run with an idea and it's like keep rolling with it because we can't stop and go. Oh, what do you think of this? And then doobity doo, and then it takes us out of it and we're overthinking it. Where it's like just run with it and we can listen to it afterwards and pick out the parts, much like you did with the long one. That's why I was mm-hmm. asking if you've ever considered live streaming because that's what we've done is we cut out the different parts we like and then repurpose those in our own personal time and multi-tracking. Whereas with the live ones, we just record the live session one, because then it's like, Hey, it's a form of, like you said, it's, it's marketing. It's probably the most easiest form of marketing because we're just playing live. You're a live band. Yeah. And then with two, we can just then pick it apart and multi-track and try different sounds, but like the ideas out there. And also you're forced to go in a certain direction because it's live. Um, mm-hmm. because you can't stop. I mean, we could stop. There's nobody telling us we can't, but you feel silly knowing people are watching going, oh, hold on a sec, hold up, hold up. You know, Yeah. you think yeah, of it like it, being on stage, but I get both sides of it for sure. A, a lot of like playing live for me, I've a lot of the decisions that I've made in, in a band context has been like, this part, we're just wasting people's times with. Like, mm-hmm. like may, maybe, you know, there is some trance inducing thing that, gives it merit to just repeat yourself or whatever, or, or really indulge, be indulgent about it. But it's like, at the end of the day, I feel like whenever you're putting on a live show, uh, that is a representation of you, like that somebody paid for. Now Mm -hmm. that's, that's probably something that delineates it quite a bit, but that somebody paid for, you don't want to waste their time with, with your self-indulgence and stuff. Whereas with like a live stream and stuff, yeah, have at it. Mm -hmm. um you know you don't you know the musician pj harvey oh yeah love pj harvey yeah she's one of my hugest inspirations um she did that that installation where they made the hope six demolition project Mm -hmm. in a glass box for everybody to just walk in and watch them do their creative process with and occasionally you know by the end of the day you saw them do one song or or two songs Mm -hmm. like as they're as they're kind of pounding them out and stuff I think that's a, you know, that's kind of a future wave sort of way of doing it. Cause like to invite the audience into the creative process, even if they don't have like an active role in it, they're still observing and they're still contributing in some way to it. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a very vulnerable thing too, because like, I don't know, I feel like if you were to watch me for eight hours working on tracks and stuff, you would be bored to tears because it's all just like setting levels. Oh, oh I got to get that saturation just right. Mm-hmm. Oh, the when's the flange come in? Okay. It, you know, it's, it's so, I mean. No, but there are some people out dry. there that really are into that, you know, uh, even just seeing the process, even just popping in, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it's, yeah. The, the biggest part is, well, I guess with music, it's different. Like when I do live drawing streams, you have to keep talking. Because there's yeah. nothing else going on, but you drawing. Sure, you can watch people draw, but it's like, I don't know. It's weird without audio, but or with you music, try, you, you can, can try at least the, play stuff. You could try the ASMR thing where you <laughs> mic up the, the paper real close. And it, <sighs> this is actually a good point. I like, oh, wait, no, I draw digitally. Uh, I draw. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, maybe, I, I guess you could hear my, your mouse. Yeah, the sliding it, of the, the tablet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I I like that yours just sounded like it was like a quiet fart. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's all it's all art. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) You can't have art without fart. Um, No, other way around. Either way, that joke didn't land. But (laughs) now, getting back to more serious things. So you have your studio that you have. Is it at your home? Do you have a place where the studio is? Like, where is it located? Yeah, it's it's just the basement. It's Oxford Road Basement Studios. Right, which is Orbs, so, which I love that yeah, that's orbs. the abbreviation of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I put a lot more thought into that one than my band name. When did but, you set uh, it up? Oh, it's been a growing process since we moved here, which was which is around a decade ago. Okay. Um, we're in the process of buying the place. So oh, nice. So I'll definitely be like, well, I'm already nested. I'm not moving all this junk. Yeah. You know, cabling and 
Uh, it's just a nightmare. But it's it's mostly a in the box style recording thing. But we've got space to do live treatments and stuff, live amping. It's just not a very good drum sound. Oh, I can. Because it's that. a big the big concrete box, so it, there's no dialing back that slap back. Mm -hmm. How do you but, have everything mic'd in? Like, what's your setup? Do you have just is all of it connected to the sound card? I mean, are you just ready to go on whatever you choose to play? Yeah, I've got two mixing boards uh, that are just analog in stuff. Uh, they run into a, a Focusrite Scarlett 18i20. Mm -hmm. It's real, real rudimentary stuff. I've, I've been thinking about upgrading, but it's like, you know, one thing at a time. I got to spend $5,000 on a synthesizer before I should upgrade my recording rig, right? Priorities. Yeah, right. <laughs> Horrid priorities. But um, yeah, everything's routed into a patch bay. So, and I don't do a ton of like multi-track overdubs. Mm -hmm. I like to do things one thing at a time and get them right, get my texture right and get my sound stage right. Yeah. Um, so I'm usually working on drums and bass one day and then I'll unpatch everything and start working on maybe vocals just to guide the song and then, then I'll, uh, you know, bust out the sense and it's like, how am I feeling today? I'm fi I'm feeling like a Selena day. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like plugging the Selena into a, a small stone phaser, like classic funk style, the uh, R and B sort of thing. Uh, or, or I'm feeling like, you know, acid world and we're gonna, we're gonna run a 303 into a 808 and go to town. Yeah. So it's just how the mood strikes you. But everything is available to, you know, within a, a matter of minutes, you can plug any of this gear in and that's get the best going. part. Yeah. Being yeah. able to track, like there's the whole thing of practicing, but our setup relies mostly on if we got something, it's like, oh, quick push record. Like we're all set up, like even though we're live in the room, we're also mic'd up to multi track to the laptop that we have at the studio and it can go at any time. That's also how we run our live setup. So everything is set to coincide with each other for us to be able to use it in whatever way we want. It's, it's, it's one of those things where, you, yeah, you don't realize till you do it. It's like, oh my God, why have we not been doing this the whole time? Why is it like, okay, now let's set up for doing the thing we just worked on. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't we just do it in the first place? Exactly. Why weren't we just already set up? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, for if you're trying to make music off the cuff with, you know, tabla rasa and you're all just there vibing with each other, that's mm -hmm. essential. Cause you never know when you're going to catch like just that little, that perfect little riff, that perfect rhythm in there and it's going to hit. And uh, you might as well have it for posterity's sake. I mean, yeah. it, it, that is, that is pretty cheap. Yep. <laughs> These days. So yeah, you're not wasting tape anymore. Yeah. There's no tape getting cut up here. So, well, and the other reason yeah. it's beneficial too, is because uh, what will happen is it'll be like, oh, I really like that guitar riff. We should get it down. Then you go set it up and it's like, all right, play that guitar riff. Oh damn. I don't remember what I did. And it's like, you... mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no voice, voice memos and having a perpetual recording setup is like, that's, that's the key because mm -hmm. inspiration, it never strikes you whenever you want it to. Yeah. It's, it's always when you're like waking up or like you're two beers in at practice mm -hmm. or like when it, when you just want to go. Yeah. Now with the different instruments that you have and the different, I mean, you play different types of music. What, mm -hmm. I, I guess what would be, your process for when you decide to work on a project do you go i'm gonna play something in this genre of music now or i'm gonna work with these people to work on this album like how do you decide what style you're gonna work in well sometimes it's predetermined by who i'm working with because um you know there's been some times where i work with like a hip-hop artist there's a, there's a hip-hop artist around here that does um licensed music uh or licensing what, what you know the kind where you just make a bunch of music and then like if a recording company or a, a movie set or something they they need some 
right. some music. They'll just License pull from it and be music. like, yeah. yes, that, that sort of thing. So he does that sort of thing. And I've worked with him and it's like, okay, I got to be in the mindset of like, you know, socially conscious rap. Mm -hmm. um, or I worked, you know, I've recently did a house album with a friend of mine and we were like, we need to limit ourselves to certain prompts or whatever. But like most of the time these days, like if I, if I know what the mood of the song is going to be, I already have an idea of instrumentation and I feel instrumentation is like the essential core aspect of most genre mm -hmm. in general. I've got, I've got, guitars and basses and keyboards and pianos and all this good stuff um and i could just i could just move to what to the paradigm that i need like when i'm doing funk music i'm doing boogie music you know like i got a prophet going on yeah and i got and i got an oberheim playing it because that's what they used back then and i've got an, an 808 drum machine or i've got something similar uh for that sound, a Lin drum for that sound specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but if I want to do folk music, uh, you know, I got a sitar over here. I, I play the sitar, I, you know, and I get the, the finger bells out and, uh, and we're going, <laughs> of we're going flower power on it. Yeah. You know, so that's that it's at the core of all of it is instrumentation. If I know what the song's going to be like, like lyrically, cause I'm singing it like, songs flourish from a lot of songs just flourish from the way that you sing it. Yeah. So and I'm trying to remember there's one song you have when you said the folk song and I'm sorry, I'm switching screens here so I can see it Ah, the time. There's a song that you have called oh, yeah. the time, which is a combination of sort of when I first heard it, I'm like, okay, this is kind of fo wait, No, it's not folksy. It's bluesy. And then the singing comes in and I'm like, no, this is like early Prince. This is like pre controversy Prince, mm -hmm. you know, it, it it's a cool song and it was unexpected from what I knew of what I had played on the music show that I did. And I was enjoying that. That was an interesting, uh, an interesting song. Tell me about well, that album and how that came about. I really like that. Okay. So I, I do have this, this soft core syndicate thing that yeah. is just this goofy funk boogie thing that I want to do. Which is ironic because the song I found you on was called gin boogie and it's more of a, like yeah. a industrial song. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, contextualize it with words, however you, however you please. Right. Um, but that, that album was a uh, hauntological fallacies, 1986. And it was called 86 because I used a Korg DW 8,000 keyboard mm -hmm. and a, a Korg DDD one drum machine, okay. which were kind of big in the, in the boogie scenes back then the DW8000 was like one of the last analog. It was kind of like a digital analog hybrid kind of going, going along with the DX7, but it still had analog filters and all this cool stuff. And uh, the DDD1, it's like the sound of new Jack. Yeah. You know, like Bobby Brown and stuff like that. Right. So it's like the new Jack drum machine. So that whole album was, was using that instrumentation primarily, just those two pieces. Mm -hmm. And and I'd already had the idea for the time uh, for a softcore syndicate song, and I just flushed it out with just that instrumentation because it's it's exactly the sound that I wanted. So, but I really wanted that lush kind of like there's an there's an artist out right now, K Trinata, that does just these gorgeous lush pads on everything, or has like a really sweet kind of Ober Oberheim style bass line on it, mm -hmm. and. It, that's that's purple to me. That's the purple sound. Okay. Because it, it, it harkens right back to Prince in the time. Yeah. And the whole Star Company thing, Jesse Johnson, uh, uh, Apollonia 6, Vanity 6, uh, mm -hmm. all, all that, that group of musicians, they all kind of use that same instrumentation. Uh, and the time was sort of a celebration of like the, like, oh, baby, I want to love you so bad, but I ain't got the time. So, because the humor of softcore syndicate, I think, is pretty essential. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I love that funk music, and it is a essential part of me. But at the end of the day, I love it so much because it's so damn goofy. Yeah, like it's it's so much fun. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of what the time was about. Was just a little introduction to that. 
and I do enjoy the Bay and the Time too. Even when they went into the uh, Terry Lu- or Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis phase when they did the Pandemonium album, that song mm-hmm. "Jerk Out" is still a jam yeah. from that from that album. <laughs> oh, dude, Jam and Lewis's productions are so phenomenal. Like they did an album with SOS Band called "Sands of Time." that I think is like the Bible for R and B like yeah. modern R and B and sh- the, the stuff they did with Shirelle is so good. It's just so funky and mm-hmm. just freaking perfect. And then they did like, um, a stuff with change. Have you heard, have you heard change? Like, no. Give me back all my love. I oh. had a change of heart. It, it's, oh man, it's That's so funny. smooth. It's so good. It's, it's probably all the same, uh, drum machine beat for every single song but right it's the perfect beat hmm. it's the perfect data weight line <laughs> okay i don't know I, I i geek hard about that era of music because like clear and cameo and uh yeah the, all those all the imagination those bands just really really get me going and inspire me constantly I, it's kind of at loggerheads with you know my background in more psychedelic music mm-hmm. but i i do feel like you know those people were inspired by the same people 15 20 years before who were making oh, yeah. you know psychedelic folk and stuff i mean everybody was listening to records back then it, it was like you got a record collection you're gonna listen to the whole record collection because you bought it mm-hmm. and it's real and it's in your hand so yeah. i feel like it kind of had a little more importance back then because what well, else were you? It, it was do? also easier to leaf through too. Like while I mm-hmm. have a really big collection of stuff that I listen to, I always am going. I don't know what to listen to, and it's you can't just scroll through everything. It takes forever. You start with the A's, and then you know it's, by the time you <laughs> yeah. get to the B's, you're like, all right, I'm just going to pick something uh, from the B's. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I usually end up on Cocktail Twins. Uh, oh, nice. And that's that's it. I don't. I, I don't know, can or cocktail twins. I'm not going through the rest of my collection here. <laughs> oh, and you know, God forbid they have the in front of their name, then they're never going to get played. Yep. Um, nope. So with uh, all the stuff that you're doing before we go today, is there any projects that you're working on things that you are planning to do that you'd like to tell people about? Oh yeah, totally. Um, I mean, in the last year, I did a, a record with my friend Howie. It's called Dharmic Beams. Dharmic, like D-H-A-R-M-I-C, and then beams, like beams of light. Yeah. Uh, and that's that was that house album I was talking about. I'm super proud of what we did with it. I mean, it's like a full-on Boards of Canada-style collaboration. Like, you know, we, we were a, a pair that were creating – with the purest impulse i feel like for for a lot of the stuff i've done like just serving a song and like making it as cool as you could and i'm really proud of it i think it's some of the best stuff i've done recently and uh uh then also i've got softcore syndicate we i put out an album last december uh and it's up online in the places it's just called um if it ain't enough it's too much Super proud of that record. Coming up here in the future, I'm going to do another uh, Lovecraft release that's uh, a little bit more like um, dark trip hop sort of stuff. But it's okay. a song. It's an actual songy song with words and oh. and structure and stuff. And uh, maybe make an EP out of that. And then uh, I've got some more softcore syndicate in in the in the works right now. Even even synthier, even funkier, even funnier that I cannot wait to let the world hear. Uh, but, you know, I don't get myself out there that much. So yeah, it'll probably, it'll probably just sort of dissipate into the air. But that's fine because it's all about the process and it's all about the, the vibrations, you know. Yeah. When you collaborate with other people, how do you go about that? Do they come to your studio and work on stuff or do you share it back and forth? Like, how are you doing that? Most of it is remote. I mean, it it's all it's all online so like we i send him wave or he sends me wave files i send him an overdub most of the time that i've done it i've had the privilege of being able to mix it myself mm-hmm. because mixing and editing and that's a big part of my process uh and then they'll mix or they'll master it or i'll master it um it's it, we kind of delegate tasks and stuff 
But you're but, saying somebody will record a track and you'll export the stem and then the person will add it on their end? Like what's the process for they did something, how do they get it back to you? They're working in Pro Tools too, like? I don't, I don't know. Some of them, you know, some of them do Studio One, some of them do uh, Reason or whatever it is, Reaper. Yeah. Um, use, but WAV files are the, you know, universal right. tool So you'll just me, send so. them a mix down and they'll play on top of it. Yeah, or or like yeah, if if I want an overdub from them, but that that's kind of rare. I I don't really like you know farm out. Like if I want somebody to record something, they come here. Like if it's a guitarist, okay, I they come here and we we set up a big old thing, or we'll be up upstairs or downstairs. That's what I was wondering. Whatever. Like when you have somebody yeah. record a track for you, how do they go about doing it? That's what I was. Yeah, wondering. yeah, mostly guitar vocal type stuff that's all i want to record it so i have full control over the sonic environment um, okay but but if i'm doing stuff for somebody else yeah i'll just send them away file pop it over there make sure it's at the right level for them and they could probably just slip it in without ne even needing to mix it right ideally because i don't want them to miss a second of my magic you know <laughs> That was also no. borderline creepy the way you did that. Like you seemed like an evil genius. Don't you miss a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I try not to be a fascist about it, um, <laughs> but I, th I think sometimes I, I do come off a little fascistic. With no, uh, you don't. With, you, you, uh, yeah. The, now I know what people, I like. Yeah, and if people wanted to check out your stuff, where should they go look for your music? Um, Lovecraft.bandcamp.com. Has, and that's craft just with an F, not a T. Yeah, it's L U V C R A F dot bandcamp dot com. That's that's most of my personal out, output. Um and you know, we're up on all the streaming services and Spotify and blah 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 blah. You know, you know please please check out my reverb nation page. <laughs> I had um, I actually looked that up the other day to see if it was still around. I had forgotten all about it and it Is popped it? into my head. It's still there. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. I so, pity the Paul Fools <laughs> were using that still. <laughs> or like MySpace music, you know, like yeah. the, the, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's a little antiquated, but well, you know, uh, Reverb Nation aside, I want to thank you very much for talking with me today. It was great meeting you. Well, thank you. It was a it was a pleasure meeting you too.